Hello and welcome. welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual panel on creative responses to barn swallow decline. As we are all participating virtually today, we are spread out all over Turtle Island or North America. And I just wanted to uh, start by saying that I'm talking to you all today from my home in Kitchener. And of course, I'm so privileged to spend a lot of my time at RARE. And as a settler on these lands, I acknowledge and am grateful to all of the original stewards of the land in which RARE resides and the land that I live and work on, uh, which is the Haldeman Tract spanning six miles wide on either side of the Grand River from source to mouth. Understanding that land, this land has been rich in diverse Indigenous presence since time immemorial, there are several Indigenous nations that I would like to mention. We'd like to honor and respect the sovereignty of both First Nations in our area, the Haudenosaunee peoples of the Six Nations of the Grand River and Anishinaabe peoples of Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Naiwe and Miigwech, to these nations who share their lands with us. Lastly, we'd like to acknowledge those Indigenous peoples who currently live, work, and learn in the urban landscape around us, such as self-identified and status First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Of course, you might be participating from somewhere else today, so I encourage you to learn more about the land that you're living on, uh, learning on, and working on. And one resource I can point you to is uh, an app called Whose Land, which is available for download for free, and it's a great starting point to learn more about the traditional territories that you um, reside on. So I'm excited today to get started, and I just have a quick... Uh, a few quick housekeeping items before we dive into the subject at hand. Um, we're going to hold questions tonight until the end of the webinar, but feel free to pose a question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll um, hopefully have a chance to get to all of the, uh, what I'm sure will be incredible questions for our panelists um, as we work our way through tonight. And I'd like to just start by setting the stage for the species of the hour or the hour and a half that will be together tonight, which is the barn swallow. Um, the barn swallow, and, and if you have a connection to barn swallows, tell us in the chat what brought you here tonight, what your interest is, and, um, and how you're connected to barn swallows, because that's really what we're here to talk about. And it's really interesting to know sort of um, what everyone's connection is with this charismatic species. So the barn swallow is a medium-sized songbird with a blue back and wings and a rusty red face and underside and a deeply forked tail. They are aerial insectivores, meaning that they eat mainly flying insects. And they build cup-shaped mud nests on almost exclusively human-made structures. They can be seen throughout North America. And in Ontario, they breed as far north as the south shores of Hudson Bay. But about 90% are found in southern Ontario. Perhaps that's not surprising, given that's also where the bulk of human, the human population also resides. This species is experiencing drastic declines and is listed as a threatened species both across Canada and here in the province of Ontario. Nesting structures have been constructed to attempt to replace destroyed habitat. And you might have seen two examples of this on the trails or up at the gardens at the Rare Reserve if you've ever visited. Um, and they've really had mixed success. And they've also sparked sort of a larger conversation about conservation strategies for this and other species. So that's really what we're here tonight to talk about, keep those conversations going and dive into this great bird. Okay, so on to the panelists. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the faces you'll be seeing tonight. I'm going to uh, share with you some short bios and I'll also post the full bios in the chat if you want to learn more about our great panelists tonight. So we have first Mara Silver. Mara has been working on swallow conservation projects for the past 30 years, primarily cliff and barn swallow projects. In 2007, she founded Swallow Conservation, a Western Massachusetts-based nonprofit organization whose goal is to conserve and protect swallows that breed in Northeastern North America. So welcome, Mara, and thanks for joining us tonight. Next, we also have Jennifer Clary Lemon. She's an associate professor in the Department of English Language and Literature at the University of Waterloo. 
She studies how humans and non-humans might best communicate in a time of increased species loss. And as part of her work, she's launched an arts-based research creation project that promotes reflection on barn swallows as a species of risk. And you can visit that art structure in front of the Eco Center and Slip Barn at the Rare Reserve at 768 Blair Road, should you be interested. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that tonight. So welcome, Jennifer. We also have Marcel O'Gorman. He's a, research, a university research chair and founding director of the Critical Media Lab at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and he leads collaborative projects and workshops in critical design and the philosophy of technology. So welcome, Marcel. Thanks for joining us. And we uh, also have Murray Burgess with us tonight. She's an associate wildlife biologist and urban ecologist, currently a PhD student in wildlife and conservation biology at North Carolina State. Marie studies the effects of artificial light um, at night on barn swallow chick health development. And she's also a children's uh, author with uh, her first book, Sparrow Learns Birds, coming out in 2022. So welcome, Marie. And finally, I'll introduce Chris Rogers. Christopher Rogers is our uh, facilitator tonight, so I welcome him to the screen as well. He's a PhD student in the Department of English at the University of Waterloo, and his research interests focus on theory and critical practices in the humanities that foster accountability and inclusivity while accounting for multiple ways of knowing. So welcome to all our panelists. I will turn it over to you, Chris, to take it away. Thanks, Jenna, for all those introductions. It's great. So uh, we're going to start off, as Jenna said, uh, by listening to each of the panelists. Uh, they're going to give a 10 minute uh, presentation and then we'll go into a Q&A. Uh, so don't forget to uh, you can put those Q&A questions in uh, as, you, as they come up and we can get to them after the after the panelists. So we're going to start with Mara. Uh, Mara, if you'd like to uh, take over now uh, and uh, add your slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Can everyone see me okay? <laughs> um, great. Um, thank you, first of all, to Jenna for inviting me to participate in this uh, presentation tonight. It, barn swallow is a very worthy topic in my mind, so I was happy to hear from her and be asked to join. Um, I think the easiest way for me to give a little history on how I got interested in barn swallows is to move on to some slides that I have prepared. Um, I originally, just to give the background before the swallows, I did my undergraduate work at um, College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor in Maine, and I was pretty focused on uh, seabirds. And, did field work and uh, projects related to seabirds for several summers, but then um, pretty quickly switched over to swallows when um, I encountered cliff swallows, which are a similar species to barn swallows, but a different species. I'm going to talk to them, talk about both a little bit, um, back in the early 90s. So I'm going to... Um, just share a screen in a second here. Okay, so uh, what you see here is a cliff swallow on the left and a barn swallow on the right. And as Jenna was saying, these are uh, songbirds. They're aerial insectivores, so they are st they st strictly insects in flight. Um, as you can tell, they're very aerodynamic with very short legs. So they are designed for catching prey in flight. And my interest began with cliff swallows when a um, house that I was living in had about 20 pair nesting under the eaves. And cliff swallows, unlike barn swallows, build bottle-shaped nests of mud under the eaves, generally, well, on cliffs in out west and um, under bridges in prolific numbers out west. But here in the Northeast, you tend to find cliff swallows like cliff like barn swallows nesting alongside humans. Cliff swallows on the outside building uh, bottle-shaped mud nests and barn swallows generally inside buildings built and they construct a cup-shaped nest. 
Um, what I found was that uh, with cliff swallows, this was back in the early 90s, the colony that I observed uh, about 80% of the nests, the 20 nests, it, you know, many, most of them either fell, clean off the surface of the house that the birds were nesting on, or were taken over by house sparrows, which are a na non-native species that compete for um, nesting cavities. And both occur, house sparrows and cliff swallows on farms. So um, that was the first thing I observed. And um, the, what I did, what I was able to do was get some grant money. And my goal was, and my all my, my work in the sciences in the last 30 years has been focused on conservation, not just simply answering a question, but on the ground, how do we apply what we're learning to helping swallows. So I figured um, I exper experimented with mud. Um, again, this is like practical te techniques to help swallows on the nesting grounds. Clay, adding clay to mud. Um, I had a, I was doing this work at a pilot site that was owned by Mass Audubon, which is a conservation organization down here. So I created this mud source. And I also created um, artificial nests out of clay. Um, so if you can see in the photo on the left, the little pink area is what I made. It's a fired ceramic, what I call a nest start. And on the right, you can see complete bottles that I made that the swallows added to. And these again are cliff swallows. So we'll get to barn swallows. This is just my background. Um, and the combination of a mud source, which actually attracted the swallows and supports for the nest and actually them being able to use completed nests and not taking the time to build them really increased breeding success. Now at the same farm, there were barn swallows nesting in the barn. And you can see the open windows at the very top of the peaked roof. And um, I wasn't focused on barn swallows, but unfortunately the organization did some work to the barn and closed the windows. And something as simple as that ended the barn swallow population at that property. And there had been about 15 pair that nested up there in that attic area. So I think, you know, these, these again, practical things. Um, when I, I moved on to working with barn swallows, the first thing I did at barns, this is my pilot site for my barn swallow study was open windows, open doors, create mud sources, and create artificial nests. These are the practical, practical things that I've done. Now, Barn swallows, cliff swallows, and other aerial insectivores are declining for lots of reasons, but the one tangible thing that I've found that I can address is habitat here on their breeding grounds. We need big policy changes to deal with the declines related to climate change and pesticides and things we'll talk about later. This is a little bar artificial barn swallow nest and just to show you. So what you can see here is what I've made is the uh, smoother part of the nest and the barn swallows added to that where you can see the darker mud above. And then you can see they actually use them and barn swallows are extremely attracted to old nests. And if you can fake them out, they'll use them. So just quickly, cause I don't wanna go further than my 10 minutes. Um, this is just, you know, if you ignore the red line which is cliff swallows because uh, at the site that this data was taken, cliff swallows had never, I was trying to attract cliff swallows to a site where they had never nested. And they showed up and they nested, as you can see, for a couple of years, but then they have, they've been absent for the last, since 2018. But barn swallows, in spite of these larger declines, and we're having declines just like, I'm in Massachusetts, I'm in the US, and just like you in Canada, we're having declines. We haven't listed barn swallow yet. Um, and I don't think it's going to happen for a while. But in spite of the declines, which are particularly pronounced in the Northeast, these changes that I made, simply opening the barn, um, creating a mud source, installing artificial nests, 
led, you can see led has led to an increase. And actually this isn't up to date. It goes, the, the data goes till to 2020. And this past year, I actually had nine nests. So I had the highest number of nesting pairs um, that I had. Um, this was a site that always had barn swallows. It was a farm that historically had barn swallows, but when the farming operation shut down, the barn had been shut. And so they, the, the swallows were only nesting in a little shed area attached to the barn and there were only a couple, one to two pairs. So um, as you can see, it was encouraging to me to see that in spite of larger scale declines, actions, taking actions, practical, simple actions at a nesting site can really have positive benefits. Um, and since that, since I've sort of developed these techniques, my next action was to try to share this information with others who could find it useful at sites where they want to encourage barn swallows, encourage cliff swallows. I find with cliff swallows and with barn swallows, I've tried attracting them, them to sites where they've never nested. And it's not always successful. There are factors probably that are important to the swallows that we can't see. A site might look perfect, but there may not be enough food. Um, the wind, the, the, the weather conditions may not quite be right. So um, I've, I've tried to share what I've learned through just years of ob observation and experimentation with these techniques with others. And down here, we talked a little about alternative structures already. Um, because the swallow, barn swallow isn't listed down here, we haven't really experimented with alternative structures, but larger barns are coming down. And since I've been in touch with people in Canada working with barn swallows and I've learned about alternative structures, I'm trying to like get the word out that it's not uh, the, the, these small kiosk like alternative structures do not equal a big empty barn for a bunch of reasons that we'll probably talk about a little later as well. So I don't want to take up more than my allotted amount of time. So thanks again for inviting me. And I hope this gives you a little background on my history with barn swallows and cliff swallows. Thank you so much, Mara. And I'm going to pass uh, the ball over to uh, Jennifer Clary Lemon. Uh, Jen? Uh, you can take it away as soon as uh, Mara's finished sharing her screen. Thanks, Chris. And um, thanks, Jenna, for inviting me and Marcel. This is a kind of co-produced project. So I'll be talking a little bit at first, and then Marcel will be talking a little bit more in depth about what we actually did. Um, before this webinar started, um, Jenna made me aware that there are birders in the audience and that made me really nervous because you all know more than I do about barn swallows already. Um, however, what I think is really important about this initiative that Rares put together is that it really joins um, folks who have expertise in biology and science with those of us who might be located more in the arts and humanities. So it's really exciting for me to be a part of this talk and to kind of share what we did and, and listen, especially to Mara and Murray um, about their expertise. So I'll share my screen and um, I'll just warn you the first slide is a little bit um, uh, jumpy. So I won't, I won't stay on that for too long, but uh, since we're talking about creative responses to barn swallow decline, I thought it would be a, a good one. So let me just share. Hopefully you can all see that one. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, when I first became interested in, in barn swallows. Um, and that was as a child, I lived on, when I was very small, I lived on a rodeo grounds. And so it was um, the house on the grounds that um, would attract both barn and um, cliff swallows. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, but I was um, fascinated by, um, by what I would see as a young child. And it, I kind of promptly forgot that. I moved a lot as a kid. So I, I forgot that memory. And then um, 
uh, I moved to Ontario uh, three years ago, and I was reminded of, uh, of that interest by another curiosity, and that was seeing structures on the side of Highway 401. Um, many of you are probably familiar with these, or if you're not, I mean, you live in the perfect place to go see them. Um, and I was kind of filled with this curiosity. I was like, what am I seeing on the side of the road? Are these, I, I didn't know. I didn't know farmers were doing advertising. I, I had no idea what they were. And I, um, I had a lot of ideas, but none of them quite fit the bill. And, and I met a lot of people for whom that is also the case. And so um, for me, part of part of all of my scholarship is following my curiosities. So I kind of wanted to um, discover, or uncover the mysteries of these structures on the landscape. And also, you know, I, I'm a teacher of rhetoric. So for those of you, it's a very, that, that'll end conversations in a heartbeat if you say that. But what that means is I'm interested in how people are persuaded by a variety of things, um, other people, and in this case, I was really interested in how people were persuaded by these structures and what function they served on on the landscape. Um, and so it wasn't until I started researching them that I realized that they were built as a surrogate habitat for barn swallows. And what that means, um, for those of you not familiar, is that every time uh, we tear down critical habitat, as Mara said, a big barn in Canada uh, or a bridge, for example, we are required by Canada's Species at Risk Act, which is also known as SARA, um, to build something close to the habitat that we've destroyed because these, this species is listed on that act. Um, and I believe that on some of the materials that were circulated, um, some kind of facts about barn swallow decline were put forward, and that is in the last 30 years. In the United States, they've declined about 38%, and in Canada, 67%. Um, and usually, once a species is listed on an act like the Endangered Species Act in the United States or the Species at Risk Act in Canada, um, one, they never get off the list, unfortunately. There are very few uh, circumstances in which once, they, once a species is listed as at risk in some way, um, that they ever become not at risk. Uh, but the other is that it becomes illegal not only to harm the species, which is often kind of covered under the Migratory Birds Act, um, but also you have to protect its critical habitat. And what I found really interested, uh, interesting about the case of the barn swallow is that normally when we think about critical habitat, we think about preserving open spaces, uh, for example. But because barn swallows have emerged as a kind of parallel species with humans, that is to say, as human populations have gone up over time, barn swallow populations have also gone up. Um, and that's a kind of historical parallelism that in recent memory, as human populations go up, barn swallow populations have, have begun to decline. And so this is something too um, that I think about a lot. I think about barn swallows and other aerial insectivores um, and grassland birds that are in decline. I think about these as being the kind of canary in the coal mine that, that should tell us something about being human right now because, um, because those patterns are beginning to, to shift um, considerably. Uh, so, because barn swallows roost and nest exclusively now on human built structures, they don't nest anywhere else. Um, recovery strategies for its critical habitat then also have to be human built structures. So this is a, the stands in really stark contrast to other kind of action plans about species at risk and, and mitigating their loss. And so this is how the barn swallow structure that you see at the side of the highways um, was born. It came out of, of this kind of, of initiative and consideration for this species. Um, and so as I did my research, I also realized by and large, as, as Mara was um, discussing, that they function as failures. So yes, they are sometimes um, successful. So barn swallows sometimes do nest in them. But by and large, uh, as she noted, a, a barn is not a, a nesting kiosk. That they, they, barn swallows know better than we do uh, in terms of um, bringing something that small, building something that small and expecting a barn swallow um, as though they, they, they don't know better. I think it doesn't take a lot of, um, uh, a lot of expertise to know that, that one of these things is not like the other. And so 
so for me, I wanted to create something that would allow one humans to really um, engage with these the, these structures and the failures that they represent. Um, for those of you who might have seen these structures on the side of the 401, you're whizzing by them. So it's not really an opportunity to, to stop. In fact, that's illegal and go look at them. And so I wanted um, for those folks who also have curiosity like I did when driving by, I wanted to create something that would allow um, someone to engage with these structures, to be curious and to maybe have some of their curiosities answered. And so that was the reason that Herondalusia, which is what Marcel will talk about after me, which is an art-based conservation um, barn swallow structure kind of made for human interaction rather than bird interaction. That's why it was conceived, uh, because I wanted to tell a story of barn swallow decline that humans might listen to in a different way, since obviously the birds are going to make their own choices about whether or not to engage with, with these structures. Um, and I, and I also wanted to create a site of interaction for, for humans to kind of approach these structures and really think about, um, think critically about the loss of a species uh, which has declined so significantly in my lifetime anyway. And, um, and I also wanted to create something that would move us toward a kind of public acknowledgement of species loss. I think it's one thing to, to read um, news bylines that tell us about uh, how many species we're losing at a time, but I think it's really different um, to create something that allows um, that sense of loss and that sense of grief uh, for, for human beings. So I wanted to make a space where humans could think about that. And, and that's, that, that was my, my reason for, for creating an arts, arts-based response to barn swallow decline. Um, however, this is not the only, uh, you know, obviously I, I'm an academic, so I work in the land of words, and Marcel helped me work in the land of things because I'm also not a builder. It was a very difficult project for me to engage in. But part of my research was also talking to people who had um, come up with creative ways of their own to either mitigate species loss or to think about barn swallows and conservation. Um, and so one of, one of those examples um, was from a farmer who he couldn't be here tonight because of his internet was, was not reliable, um, but I'll show you what he did. Uh, and this is his barn, this is the inside of his barn. Um, which was home, it's home to about 30 nesting pairs of barn swallows. This is a huge barn. You see the tractor looks tiny on the screen. Um, it's enormous. And if you look up, it's a kind of a strange ceiling. What he did was he created this huge tarp that he had um, uh, kind of sewn together through the rivets. And he tarped the ceiling of his barn because he was an asparagus, he is an asparagus farmer. Um, you can't have, you can't be dealing with processing food in the same place where you have bird guano. And so most farmers wind up um, killing the birds that, that uh, are, interfere with their livelihoods. And what he did instead, um, saying to me, well, the birds have been there longer than I have, uh, was he tarped his entire barn ceiling. So the birds get the attic space and he gets the workspace below. And, and again, this is kind of a person to person singular um, way, creative way that, that we might face and, um, and creatively attend to species decline. Um, and I, I'll, I'll close up there, but, but I will say that, you know, one of the, the biggest questions that I often found folks uh, wrestling with when they were encountering barn swallow structures, these alternate ways of thinking um, about these species is what is this thing for? Right. This is the curiosity. What's this thing on the landscape? What is it for? And I think that, you know, when we get so consumed with what is this thing for, we we maybe overlook the larger, larger question, which is what are we losing? And so that's kind of the, the question that I that I hope um, folks listening will will grapple with. And I will let Marcel otherwise take it away um, and talk about the project um, that we that we worked on together. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, and thank you, Jenna, for, uh, for inviting us and everyone for attending today. Um, I'm, I, I don't wanna alienate anyone today by talking about artistic practice, but so I'll do my best here. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. Um, so I'm, I'm 
work at the Critical Media Lab, I founded the Critical Media Lab at the University of Waterloo. I generally think about impacts of technology on society, but I define technology quite broadly. And a barn swallow structure to me is a technology that is designed to mitigate designed to mitigate species decline, but it also it serves primarily a symbolic function. I'm really interested in failure and technological failures. So this project was super interesting for me to take on. Uh, the method I've used for this project, this is what I teach at the university primarily, is something called critical design. I'm not going to belabor this. Maybe nobody cares because we want to talk about birds, but I'll just say that this is an approach to, um, to design and to artistic practice that's about problem finding and not problem solving. So if you think of these mitigation structures as a, as a problem solving kind of tactic, the, the, my response to this and Jen and I working on this, we're thinking about problem finding. How can we present this problem to the public and show them uh, what's at issue here? And it's actually, you know, this, this book, on critical design by Matt Malpass talks about critical design is rhetorical. How can you persuade people through the creation of an object as opposed to through the creation of, uh, of an essay or words or a policy? So I have a long history of working with strange objects um, like this uh, coffin that you sit in and learn about why sitting in front of a screen is bad for you. Uh, I put a greenhouse inside the art gallery of Windsor. I work with a penny farthing bicycle a 16 foot cedar and canvas canoe for the Tom Thompson gallery. And I lit an arcade cabinet on fire and rebuilt it and allowed people to play that arcade cabinet burning on the cabinet, if that makes sense. So these structures to me, which I've seen for, for a long time, I have family in Windsor and I would drive down the 4-1 and see these things and wonder what are they? Are they, you know, are they cell phone kiosks where you can go and get out of the rain and make a call? Um, what are these things? They, they do call to us, they're, they're curious. And um, so when Jen mentioned this project to me, I jumped at it because I do have a, a great interest in birds. I have a friend who works at Point Peely National Park. I've been birding with him. I wouldn't call myself a birder either. I'm scared to do that like Jen. I've been birding with him at Point Peely. And when I lived in Florida, we um, went, he brought me, went and watched migrations in Florida when I lived there, it was amazing. So this project interests me um, for obvious reasons. And when Jen asked me to participate, I just came along, tagged along and took photos and tried to get a sense of what was going on with these structures and what was the kind of, um, I, I understood the, the kind of engineering tactics at play and the mitigation tactics at play, but what is the mood of these things? And these are really lonely structures, which is, you know, I kind of followed Jen around as she was looking at these structures and just getting a sense of these things as these bizarre sort of um, lonely, desperate attempts to do something um, that wasn't succeeding. And yeah, there's that. I won't. I won't be. I won't, I won't leave us on that erratic image. But I also saw these structures. Some of them are kind of whimsical. This one to me uh, um, was probably the most, and it actually had, it was the only one we saw that actually had barn swallows in it. Um, and I took a cue from that. And I thought there was some care put into the structure as actual, maybe with barn board, there, there are these large windows for the birds to get in and out of um, because they, they flew in through those windows more than they fly underneath. And we found out that that seems to be a regular pattern for them. And I also took, I took a look at these scenes that we were looking at from a more kind of angular and creative point of view to really understand, try to understand what was going on. And what I, what I concluded after all this and talking with Jen and about her research and watching Jen do her research at these sites was that these, these structures are almost like memorials to a species in decline. It reminded me of the ghost bike. You, you may have seen these before, but it's when a bike is put along the side of the road where someone has been in a cycling accident and has died actually. Um, so these, when I look at these structures now in the 4-1, I see them as these kind of memorial sites. So the next step was to draw up plans for this and to find, um, to basically find all of the materials in a, a most, the most kind of a responsible way possible. And we, we got barn board from uh, another artist actually, and um, started putting it together in Jen's garage, which was a 
seemed like a strange thing to do in her garage, but uh, it worked out. Uh, thanks to Chris Rogers for taking these photos, by the way. And we ended up with this. Um, we found a great location for the project by a walking trail. The intention was never for barn swallows to enter. I've just, we were just asked that on the weekend. How many swallows came to this project? Uh, maybe some checked it out, I doubt it. Um, but it was never intended for swallows. It was intended for humans to teach humans about what these structures are and about the history of the swallow as a parallel species. So inside, we have this kind of cultural and artistic history of swallows, um, a visual history. And so those prints inside show that history. And then there's also, as you see here, um, a speaker and a sensor so that when people, the structure was constantly playing um, a piano piece by Jeff Martins. And as people would enter the structure, they would hear swallow sounds. This is a snippet of the piano piece. And then when they entered the structure, it would switch from the piano piece to the sounds of swallows. And those are sounds we record in the field at the Townsend Road structure that I showed you with a circular hole cut in it, which um, is obviously a very joyful sound. And we're very fortunate to, uh, to witness swallows um, in that space. Um, just a quick word about some of the artwork I chose two to focus on because they're both kind of bizarre in that they are emerging of swallow and human. And I think this is really instructive to think about this long imagination of swallows as a parallel species. And, um, you know, these are very different. One is from a children's book. One's a little bit racy from the cover of a French, um, of a French uh, society magazine. But I like the, the poem by um, Elizabeth Gordon. The barn swallow is a graceful thing, catches his food upon the wing. Perhaps that's why he is so fond of skimming lightly over the pond. Um, so this idea of, um, you know, uh, this aerial insectivore is kind of encapsulated quite nicely in this little children's poem. And uh, I'm not gonna play this one. I, I mean, I could if people wanna see it. But there's also a uh, Looney Tunes Sylvester the Cat episode called Swallow the Leader about, uh, you know, when the swallows return to Capistrano and Sylvester the Cat is waiting there for them. Um, but uh, I guess the point is to show that there, there is this long history and that um, this is a history uh, in danger of being lost. And that's all I'm going to say for today. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. That's excellent. Um, Murray, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am Murray, and I am an urban ecologist. And a lot of my research focuses on the impacts that artificial light, also known as light pollution, has on the nightscapes and how that affects multiple different types of birds. So I am going to share my screen. and start this. So my research really focuses on barn swallow chicks and how light pollution affects their sleep and how subsequently lack of sleep affects their metabolic health and physical development. So a little bit of background, um, under normal circumstances, a chick gets fed and then the energy from its food raises its blood sugar levels. And when the chick goes to sleep under the natural conditions, um, the chick is asleep and its body converts its extra blood sugar from the food it got from the day into proteins. And proteins are super important for building up the chick's bones, their body and their feathers. And protein is also really important for powering flight. So the extra sugar turns into protein, which means the blood, the chick's blood sugar levels remain normal and stable, and then the chick wakes up and the cycle repeats. However, when you throw light pollution into the mix, the chick can't sleep at night. And that means that the extra blood sugar isn't all getting converted into the proteins that its body needs. And less proteins means that there's less resources for building the body and the muscle tissues that they need to fly. And making less proteins also means that the blood sugar remains in the blood. 
And just like in humans, high blood sugar can be symptomatic of diabetes in barn swallows. So for my PhD work, I do a field experiment with barn swallow chicks. Um, this is a barn in a snow camp, North Carolina, where I do my research. It is home to a colony of about 30-ish nesting pairs of barn swallows. And so in this barn, I have strung up some Christmas lights over their nests and made it so that half of the nest would have this artificial light and half of the nest would be controls under natural light and darkness. Um, and with this experiment, I'm hoping to test and see if chicks in light pollution have slower physical development and or higher blood sugar levels. So the data that I collect, uh -oh. I collect multiple forms of data from all of the chicks as they grow up. And the data includes weighing the chicks for their mass, measuring their wings and their legs, and tracking their feather growth. I also take blood samples to check their blood sugar levels as they develop. And to me, the birds seem especially grumpy after I draw their blood. Um, the process is similar to how we might get our blood drawn at a doctor's office. I use a needle to prick the artery on their wing and then a drop of blood glows into my glucometer for an instant reading in the field. And then the rest goes into collection tubes for a later in-depth analysis in the lab. Um, and these chicks are being raised completely by the parents. Um, I'm not doing anything to help raise them or alter their natural cycles. Um, I just take them out of the nest briefly to quickly do all my measurements and put them back. Um, and I included these pictures. All three of these are newborn barn swallows, just one day old. And just to emphasize how tiny they are, they are only like 20 millimeters long and they weigh one gram, which is like the size of a grape or like a thumbtack. And they have a whole lot of growing to do. Um, they reach the size, the same size as adults within two to three weeks. So they go from super tiny to um, regular bird size very, very fast. Um, this picture is an example of extreme wing asymmetry that occurred in one of the chicks that I was studying. And I think this is most likely due to the mother not rolling the eggs around enough to incubate evenly on all sides. Um, however, this disruption to the mother's incubation behavior could be due to the artificial lights. Now, I'm not factoring in parental incubation behavior into the study just yet. I hope to add some of those components later on, but it's definitely something that's worth looking into the future as another potential effect of light pollution, because whatever's affecting the parents is ultimately going to affect the chicks as well. In these photos, both of these chicks are eight days old. The left is from a light treatment nest and the chick on the right is from a nest that was in the natural darkness at night. And the light treatment chick on the left has not yet had feathers erupt from its pins and it's about 75 millimeters long. While the control chick, you can see little black tufts of feathers at the end of its wings and tail. And it's a little bigger at about 90 millimeters long. So you can kind of see how the chicks in the treatment nests are growing a little bit slower. And overall, my studies so far have shown that light pollution does increase stress in chicks. And that stress keeps the chicks awake and in turn reduces their body condition and their body size. However, what's been interesting so far with what I found is that the blood sugar between both groups remain statistically the same. And we think that this is because the chicks have been prioritizing their metabolic health over their physical development. So it doesn't matter to them how long or short their wings are or how long they're taking to develop just as long as everything's okay internally. And so what does this mean overall? I am still in the middle of my studies and haven't yet rejected the hypothesis that light pollution can cause um, avian diabetes. But what I'm seeing already is chicks spending longer time in a vulnerable state. They are taking longer to grow feathers, which means more time that they're dependent on their parents for food and for protection. And that also means uh, the parents are having way more work to do and spending longer having to raise their chicks. And that means less opportunity to get 
the chicks that they have fledged and maybe lay another clutch before the end of the season. And on a grander scale, this may be implicating that continued exposure to artificial lights will cause barn swallows to grow smaller over time. And maybe they'll have to adapt their bodies to higher levels of stress and less sleep. And of course, this is assuming that ca they can still do these rapid adaptations like we've seen them do to artificial structures. And so it's really important to look more deeply into artificial light and be aware of like the light that we're putting out at nighttime and turn the lights off whenever we can. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, this is all fascinating. Thank you to all the panelists for um, those great presentations. Um, I'm just going to remind everybody that the Q&A is open, so you can post your questions there, and Jenna will take them up after we uh, do some uh, Q&A here. Uh, and Murray, I was wondering if we could start with you, um, and I'm just wondering how you came to center your work and your projects on, on barn swallows. Yeah, barn swallows ended up being a really great model species because light pollution is such a global issue and barn swallows are a near global species. And they are also a species that has rapidly adapted to human development and use a lot of human structures. And so it was a great the model species for this project. Great, thank you. Now, um, Mara, I wanna pick up on something that you had mentioned, um, but you know, aerial, aerial insectivores have declined by an estimate of 59% since the 1970s in Canada and by about 32% across North America. What unique challenges are these birds facing and what conservation approaches are being undertaken to help? Well, it's interesting. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very complex question because um, first of all, uh, there doesn't seem to be one silver bullet in terms of a cause. There seems to be, men, there seem to be many factors that are implicated and you know they the declines many of the declines actually started in the 60s but the real sort of more severe declines we're seeing started in the mid 80s and you know for, as an example you know neonicotinoids have been brought up and they they have been shown to be negatively impacting um, barn swallows most of the work has been done on tree swallows um, but then those weren't introduced until the early 90s so that's an example. Um, another example of what's complicated about this question is that there doesn't seem to be an issue, say, with, with swallows in terms of the amount of food that young are being fed. So in other words, if there's problems with insect density, um, we don't, it, that doesn't appear to be an issue. There, it, it could be, so what we're thinking now is it's prey quality. So maybe, we've changed the composition of insects that parents are feeding young and it's, they're not high quality. Um, that has actually been sort of even more advanced in terms of Ethereum chimney swifts, which are another aerial insectivore. Um, for example, so with chimney swift, this is really interesting. Before um, DDT was introduced, the chimney swift diet was mainly beetles. And then um, after DDT, beetles declined and they started feeding on true bugs. And they started, de that may be part of their decline. And even though we're not using DDT, they're still eating true bugs. Why? We don't know. There's so many questions, but I think the more research we do, the more we're getting to a point where we can narrow questions. So it, it appears that nesting success in many aerial insectivores and um, survival of juveniles, you know, their first year, and even adult survival are negative, are being, are kind of what may seem to be in play. But then, you know, again, is it prey quality? Is it some effects on the wintering grounds? How is climate change playing into this? So I think right now they're just, just like climate change, it's like, it, it has so many 
impacts on, on so many in so many ways that you know there's just layers of, of questions that are being asked at different scales. Again, too, you look locally sort of here and the decline of farming, the regrowth of forests. So those are like smaller scale issues. So from small to large, um, I think we're in a stage now where we know there's a problem and it looks like it's getting really severe and we need to start answering, trying to answer some questions and that's looking harder and harder. Um, so there's clues. I mean, people are researching barn swallows and other aerial insectivores all the time. And I could talk about that for a long time, each different study. And all of those are adding pieces to unraveling the puzzle, but there's really, it's really hard to say. I know a recent study that captured my attention was about findings that the importance of smaller, even small puddles of water. I mean, a lot of these in the, in the, if we're talking about swallows, they're feeding on, many of them feed on inse insects that hatch, that spend their larval stage in water bodies. So, you know, um, that may be in, something that's really important that has changed landscape wise. Um, livestock in, in Europe, um, studies have shown that livestock, the presence of livestock at barn swallow colonies really increases um, the number of nesting pairs and breeding success and such. So to answer your question, it's a really um, a work in progress and hopefully one that um, we can start to address <laughs> with bigger policy changes or, you know, maybe, you know, I always say, you know, if you don't have to use pesticides and herbicides, you know, just err on the side of safety. I mean, I don't know if we can do that globally yet, doesn't seem so, but locally, you know, um, and that's again, sort of my thrust of what can we do that's tangible on the ground. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it does. I think it answers uh, it and beyond. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, for sure. And I'm wondering, you know, I know you touched on this as well, and anybody can jump in. Um, we know that barn swallow nesting structures have mi mixed success and you know we uh, Jen and Marcel's um, presentations also showed that um, does anyone want to jump in on on or elaborate on why they have mixed success or what message you think that those uh, structures are sending to humans who see them in the environment I can speak briefly to why I think that they are kind of successful some of the time and that has to do with um, site fidelity in in breeding and nesting grounds so barn swallows will return to the same nest they will go to south america um, in their migration and they'll return in the spring and they'll return to the exact same place um, however the way that uh, sarah mitigation rules are set up um, the structures has to be within a certain distance from the original thing that was torn down. So I think that sometimes um, based on a whole lot of other factors, uh, policy, land use, land availability, uh, sometimes these structures are built in the right place and, and the birds are curious about them and do return to them. And there's the other stuff going on. So Townsend Road that, that Marcel talked about, um, one of the things I was thinking about when Mara was was speaking is that it was it was boggy and muddy and pretty gross. And I'm like, oh, it makes perfect sense that this would be the space that um, that the birds would want to return to. So I think it also has to do with the habitat around the structure and and its um, erection. But uh, generally speaking, I don't think that that much care is given to um, or thoughtfulness about where these structures go up. They're simply a matter of government policy and rules, and they need to be built, and they need to be built as quickly as possible on available land, which is why you see them, you know, in corridors near the highway. Um, so they, I think they only really address what birds want so much. If I could just add um, another thing, I think that in my exploration um, of these alternative structures and why some of the reasons that they're not working. Is, um, for one thing, like Jen just said, you know, the site fidelity is really important. But another thing um, about the larger structures compared to those uh, kiosk type structures is that 
large barns have more stable temperatures. So for an aerial insectivorous, for an insectivorous bird, that is very important. Um, so for, for example, um, when it's really hot out, it's cooler in the structure. And when it's really cool, it's warmer in the structure. And so um, with those more stable temperatures, say, uh, say it's a cool spring, it's gonna be warmer in a big um, closed in barn and the parent can go feed itself to be in better condition for taking care of the young. Um, those kiosks are really, they're, they're, I mean, you sometimes find barn swallows nesting under docks or under uh, pavilions, but more often you find the larger colonies and the more successful colonies and the more long-term colonies in these larger barns. Another thing that some recent research has shown is that if you go into a barn at night that has a significant barn swallow colony, it isn't like you've got the, the mom and dad on each on the nest. There are birds roosting all over the barn. So, you know, young may fledge and they, you know, they they have they come back into the, the barn and they perch. I don't know if these structures have perches, but oftentimes you find um, newly fledged birds fly out and they don't just say goodbye to that barn. They fly back in, they perch it's they're out of the wind um again it's uh i think there are there are features of the actual structure that maybe weren't taken into account um so just just to add yeah thank you for that i think that it's uh these are all uh, extremely good points and right to the point point. and um i wonder i'm wondering now uh towards the the cre creative side you know Jenna Marcel, Marcel, you had the the Jeff Martin's uh, piano piece in the in the presentation. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, Lirondel and and how you came to choose it for the installation. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I think uh, I mean what's interesting about this is uh, we just came across this this uh, song and then we contacted the the artist who um, who is Dutch. And when we contacted him, he was very excited about being able to be part of this project because he's actually, um, he knew about swallows and he was actually on a piece of land where he said he was watching swallows and he's um, very interested in the birds. So, I mean, there wasn't anything specific. I think the point was that, you know, this is a, a ultimately a, a techno music artist who composes at times some classical music who is, you know, over, obviously very far away with a very different culture, but totally understands the allure of swallows enough to write about us to write a song about them. So that's really what that's all about. I mean, these the, these birds have been they've been of interest for thousands of years, from ancient Greeks and Romans, all the way up to today, of course. So yeah, it's also a very short. It's like a minute long song, which is perfect for us to loop for this project. And I, I think you can hear it now still if you go to rare and, and you if you experience the structure now it's it's still playing so. Um, it, it's pretty neat to see it in person and it actually I think speaks to the point that you know studies have suggested that you know barn swallow uh, speciation occurred really rapidly alongside humans specifically uh, colonization in the West. I'm wondering if anyone would like to speak to sort of where did barn swallows nest before people made buildings and bridges? Because we've talked about, we've seen lots of examples here, but um, before that. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, in the past, before a lot of the human development, barn swallows mainly nested on like the walls of caves or on cliff sides even. And so you kind of see how like barns and like these bridges kind of mimic those natural structures and that's where they choose to build their nests now. And you know, Murray, you know, how did the lives of barn swallows change because of human activity? You spoke to this a lot with the light pollution. Um, what were the most significant changes in human lives that sort of resulted in barn swallow population declining? Yeah, I think humans have a tendency to want to kind of exclude the wildlife that comes into their structures. And so that leads to a lot of like designs that have like exclusions and are closed off to a lot of barn swallows. 
And I think it would be really great, like some of these projects that we've talked about to build more inclusive structures to have a space where both barn swallows and humans can kind of get the best of both worlds in. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think, you know, how, and it really leads to the question, like, how can this example be used to help promote conservation approaches that really recognize humans as part of, you know, nature and not separate from it? Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in, in here uh, a little bit? I, I think from, you know, when Jenna and I were uh, traveling around and talking to people about barn swallows, we talked to a lot of farmers and we had a couple of different responses. You know, Ray, who Jen mentioned, obviously very interested in, um, in protecting them. Other farmers talked about them as a nuisance, I think. And this is a very common reaction, I think. And if you Google it, barn swallow is a nuisance. You can find plenty of instructions for getting rid of barn swallows from your property because they're noisy and because they're dirty and so on. Um, so I think that there's, you know, that there's that whole side of things. But I think farmers especially are the really are right, the key to who who owns barns, right? To understanding that and even controlling light. I would think, Murray. Um, I'm wondering if if you're talking to farmers about the use of of lights in their in their barns um, 24 hours and controlling light pollution and stuff. Yeah, and a lot of the farmers that I've come across in North Carolina are really conscious about where the barn swallows are nesting and making sure to turn off their lights. And so that's really good for this area. But I know there's a lot of outdoor illumination that sometimes we might not always be able to control just because of how prevalent artificial lights are. And I think that's where some overarching policy changes are going to need to happen to kind of help bolster what the farmers are doing on their own. Um, you know, I, I, I want to ask, and Mara had uh, that you, and there was one of the images that you had of the, the clay um, uh, nest starters that had a pattern on the inside. I know Marcel asked in the uh, in the questions if you could if you were could talk a little bit about that design. I, but also, I think it sort of speaks to the larger question of how has art um, how have you used art as a tool in conservation for swallows? I know maybe not specifically in your in your work, um, which I knew you focus very much on the practical. But I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about that pattern. Oh, yeah, no, I definitely am kind of an anomaly, like as a scientist, like I did my final project actually undergrad in ceramics. So I am very into art, as well as ornithology. And so this kind of was perfect for me, this having to make nests and having people reach out and want them. It's fun. And I've ha started decorating them. <laughs> um, this is gonna sound really non-scientific, but I do think that um, my attention to detail, and I know like oftentimes I'll say, it's really easy, make a mud puddle, put up these nests, just stir your mud puddle every day. And people are like, that's actually a lot of work. But for me, I really enjoy it. You know, like I, act, I, I get agitate the puddle and I, you know, I decorate, I mean, I was buying clay and I saw that little swallow decorating tool and I was like, yeah. And then, you know, sometimes inside I write like home sweet home. And I feel like um, that sort of welcoming feeling at my barn is helpful. It's something I could never prove, <laughs> but I think that, you know, I'm very aware of, I keep track of where the birds are nesting and the windows they like to use. And I make sure that, you know, I had trouble with chicks getting caught in windows. So like when I give presentations, I make it clear, like you, there's ways to make your barn friendly, even, you know, if you open windows, but you have certain sections closed, you know, birds can, the swallows can get trapped. I just try to like really look at every angle. And, you know, when I, in terms of the, the issue of the mess, um, I always try to explain it as like, really it's the concentration of the guano is really 
created when the young have learned to go over the edge of the nest, which is about the last two weeks of their development or so. And yes, there there is random poop around, but that's where the piles are. And it's really only two weeks and you can put a piece of newspaper down and then you move it. I always just kind of try to explain that. And most of the farmers in my experience down here really like the barn swallows. I have more issues with people who are like, well, you know, I want to turn it into an office, which then you can't, but, or I have my car parked right there. Um, but really the farmers that I've met have been very, they're like, they've been here forever. They eat the bugs. I've had a good reception with farmers here, so. Um, Jenna or Marcel, do you want to elaborate at all on the um, use of art as a tool in conservation? Uh, I know that, Marcel, you picked out two of the, the pieces from inside the, the structure itself to elaborate on. Um, if there's anything else that, wondering if there's anything else that comes to mind. I mean, for me, and of course we're not art historians, but for me, one of the things that I took away um, from just kind of curating, and Chris, you had a lot to do with that curation of images, was just how far back in time they they are they go. Um, so I think one of them that we had, I don't know that it's in the structure, but one of them that was certainly central to our thinking was from 1536. So so again, I think that when we think about um, our relationship with non-humans like barn swallows, you know, we're facing a very present moment crisis, but at the same time we have this you know, historical relationship with these animals that somehow fades from view when when we're, you know, worried about the speed at which, you know, our lives um, maybe operate right now. And so, so it wasn't so much to me about the specific image because they spanned, you know, almost every continent and they go back in time so, so far and they're on pottery and in poetry and books. Um, but it really is just how long the, um, the swallow has been with us in a very present way. So a lot of the stuff I was very interested in as a rhetoric professor was the um, connection between swallows and eloquence. So one of the myths of, of the swallow is that inside their bodies, they held red and black stones that if you put in your own mouth, you'd be given the gift of eloquence. And you know, I'm sure all of us have met an old sailor uh, with a swallow tattoo on his arm, right? That they're everywhere and, and yet they are also at the same time fading from view. So, so for me, that's kind of what, what art does for us is serves as that reminder of a longstanding relationship. I think to take that a step further, I mean, I agree with all of that is um, how can art be used to raise issues, to raise the issues of conservation? Um, so it's a it's a big problem. It's a you know a quote unquote wicked problem, as they would say in design thinking, uh, that needs to be approached from multiple different angles. I mean, obviously through science and research, but also through conservation efforts. And I think art, um, because what we'd created was a public art project. I mean, thousands of people walked by it and may, maybe learned to answer that question they were asking themselves driving down the 401 when they passed by those kiosks. Um, so I think that there are all these disciplines have a role to play in it and different kinds of knowledge, uh, including, of course, indigenous knowledge, which we haven't had a chance to touch on. But um, I think, you know, art is just a, one of the many approaches we can take to to raising these issues and raising awareness and uh, and making these issues more understandable and palatable to people. And I think I just want to add that, you know, Speaking with people who are encountering the, the structure um, that was up in the, um, in the space in Kitchener, uh, they always wanted to talk about their, their experiences, their history with barn swallows. They want, if, you, if you met somebody uh, there, uh, they, would, they want to talk to you about what's going on or what, what, the, what their history and experience has been. So I think that the, you know, using our, that art, even as a conversation sparker and as just as something to remind uh, people of, the, of the, that connection to, to the barn swallows. What do you think then is, is the intersection for farmers and landowners, scientists and artists working on barn swallows? Do you think that barn swallow conservation efforts in the United States and Canada are really doing enough to consider the, these diverse perspectives? One of the things that I'd like to see is, um, you know, because birds don't 
observe borders, right? So we have American folks here, we have Canadian folks here, we're talking about barn swells, they don't care about that border. Um, and similarly, I think we have a lot of information um, in North America about um, breeding and roosting behavior, but what we might not have is um, pairing with folks in South America where North American swallows overwinter, or Europe and Africa where European subspecies overwinter, or in Asia, um, in India and Indonesia and Australia, Australia where Asian subspecies overwinter. Like I think understanding decline is, this is a global decline. And I think it's one thing to situate it, you know, among ourselves in North America or say, well, this is what they do here in Canada. So we've listed them on, um, you know, a, a species at risk act, but we haven't listed them in, in the US because they haven't hit a critical mark of decline. Um, I think that seeing these issues as somehow local is really to our detriment because these are global declines and these are super complex problems um, contributing to those declines that we simply can't answer to as, as individuals are thinking of ourselves as somehow cloistered in our, in our country that, that really these are, um, to understand the problem of species decline that we have to work globally um, and understand where these birds go and what happens to them and why they don't return. Thanks, Jen. And I think, you know, to that point, I think we have time for one more question. And I'm wondering, you know, Murray and Mara, in your opinion, you know, what are the most pressing questions around barn swallows that we still need to uncover to really best inform, uh, you know, management strategies, conservation efforts? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is to continue to monitor how barn swallows are either continuing to adapt or following falling behind in their adaptations to these rapidly changing human environments. Um, light pollution is only just one example out of many different types that um, it's not a lot is really known about how the barn swallow responds to those types of things. And so one of the things that I always say for um, science education, um, especially with children, is that it's still important to keep common birds common. And like just because you see it every day, you might not think about it all of the time. It's still important to have these species around for a long time. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Mara, did you want to speak? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say from my perspective here in America, where we the barn swallow isn't listed, it's very frustrating for me because, um, you know, there's just there seem to be so few funds for endangered or declining species that we do wait till the 11th hour and then like turn on the alarms and it's a little late. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's sort of in my mind, it would be, you know, if we could have more funding <laughs> for, you know, and policy change sort of on a grander scale as I think we're learning more about how climate change is really affecting the planet, we also need to look at species and try to be proactive and not just responsive, like Murray said. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's all, thanks. Thank um, absolutely amazing. I'm just jumping back on here so I could wrap up with our last 10, 15 minutes here with some of the audience questions that have been submitted. Um, but first, just a big thank you. That was really great. I was just jotting down tons of questions and things to follow up on after um, because it just gets me thinking. Um, and so I really appreciate that. But we do have some questions from the audience. So I'll jump right into those. Um, so our first one is specifically for Mara, although anyone can feel free to answer. Um, if I want to attract barn swallows, but don't have any available indoor space, are there areas outdoors that I can install artificial nests. I'm guessing they mean like, is it worth it to put nesting cups and things up on the outside of structures rather than uh, inside a barn if you don't have that space available? Yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, I rarely see barn swallows um, outside of buildings. So I'm, I don't have high hopes. If you have a deep overhead hanging eave, you could try. But again, um, the best thing is if you have a garage that opens or a shed even, again, you know, um, they, if, if they, the more enclosed and cave-like 
generally the more attractive it is to barn swallows in my experience. So unfortunately, I can't really say that it's very likely, but it's always worth trying. Um, yeah, at rare, um, we've seen barn swallows attempt to build a nest on the exterior of like a, a porch on an old house. Yeah. Um, and they'll just, they'll sort of pack the mud up on the side, but it never becomes a nest. It's like That's a trial. Cool. They're just practicing. Yeah. yeah, they're making art. They're making mud art on mm -hmm. the side of the building. Um, that's great. You could get a Phoebe. I don't know. It's there are other birds that make. Another question here, are cliff and tree swallows similarly in decline or is this a special problem for barn swallows? Yes, so um, all three species are in decline um, of the aerial insectivore group, which includes swallows, swifts, nightjars, and flycatchers. Um, swallows and swifts are doing the worst in that group. Um, it's interesting, barn swallows have a global distribution, but their decline in North America is, seems to be, have picked up pace more than cliff swallows. Cliff swallows are actually increasing in certain areas of the continent and barn swallows, they're, it, they're not really, it's very negotiable. Um, so, but cliff swallows are strictly North America, you know, um, they breed in North America, winter in South America, and not on any other continent. So it's sort of interesting, um, you know, and, you know, because you have to look at it sort of like barn swallows do have a global distribution, but they're doing worse than cliff swallows in Canada and the US. Tree swallows are also declining, but they're a little more common than the other two species. Um, so yes, to answer the question, all three are declining just sort of at di in different areas and in different sort of at different speeds. But I think the barn swallow is actually doing worse in North America than the cliff or tree at this point. Uh, we have a question here that maybe Murray, you're best suited to answer. Um, do you know if Biden's climate control plan contains any actions to address light pollution that harms bird populations? So I know his climate plan doesn't address light pollution specifically, but it does talk about clean energies and clean technology, which I think can help the issue of light pollution. For example, having light bulbs that don't emit as much carbon and don't contain a lot of the blue light spectrum and is more of a warmer, redder color. That really helps with the spread of light pollution and benefits both humans and birds um, to kind of change the light technology. And that's kind of like the overall second best um, solution, I think. If you can't turn off the lights in some areas, you can at least change the types of lights to make them safer. about how social the birds are. So this is interesting. At Rare, and my first real introduction to barn swallows was that when we installed these um, nesting structures at Rare, it was part of a study to look at the impact of social cues and if those would sort of entice the birds to nest on these structures more often. So in uh, conjunction with several other paired structures across the province, we had one structure that had um, sort of decoy birds hanging all over it and bird calls playing and one that didn't have that. And the idea was to test, you know, with these social cues, um, bring more birds into nest. And um, so I have someone here attending asking that since they since they nest in these huge, large colonies inside barns, um, I think people spoke about 20 or more pairs. I've heard of definitely more pairs than that in a barn. Would you consider them to be a very social species? Do they like to be in areas where other birds are nesting? That was certainly borne out in, in the various sites that I witnessed that, um, in fact, Ray had said to me, like, this is why the structures don't work because it can, they can never hold enough nesting pairs. Not only are they social with one another, but he claims, and I make no scientific um, <laughs> claim to how true this is, he says they like people. 
and that um, that they're actually quite comfortable around people. And so they are social in that manner as well. Although I'm pretty sure that hasn't been studied um, one way or the other. I, I kind of wish uh, David Gascoigne, who's in the uh, audience, was on this panel because I'd like to see how he would answer this question, given the uh, the number of barn swallows in uh, the structure that that he's kind of tending to and and looking at at Spruce Haven. But uh, I guess that's not possible. But we can we we can wonder. Amazing colony that I've had the pleasure to see and also, um, you know, similar to your experience visiting Ray, you know, they do a great job there, um, giving opportunities for people to really come in and learn as well, which is really amazing. Um, I have a question, a personal question that uh, I thought of during your presentation, Murray. Um, the impact that you sort of noted about the light pollution, you had the chick um, that was kind of a little underdeveloped compared to the larger one. I'm wondering if you think the impact of that kind of um, slow development might be greater in areas where the birds are having to migrate farther. Um, if you think a slow development could have a larger impact if a bird has to go a large distance come migration season because maybe they're not the right size to make it all the way. Maybe if you're closer to the uh, migration grounds, they're a little bit safer. Uh, could you speak on that at all? Yeah, I totally think that's accurate. Um, having not as much development in time to make that great flight definitely makes them more vulnerable to potentially not quite making it. Um, I've also seen in my um, studies, unfortunately, that sometimes barn swallows will lay two or three clutches a season, but some of them were so late because they were taking so much time rearing the first two groups that they abandoned their eggs towards the end. And so there were some birds that didn't even get to hatch and have enough time to grow and even make the development. So it does definitely um, pushes back that timeline and slows everything down troubling for us here in Canada, they're making a little bit of a longer migration, something we should maybe be paying more attention to. Um, and then I think I'll uh, end with just two final questions. The first one, and maybe everybody could just have an opportunity to chime in on this one, anything you feel. Um, what lessons do you think we can learn from the barn swallow conservation efforts that can be applied to the ongoing biodiversity crisis that we're experiencing on a global scale? I, I'll start. Um, I think, and I was going to say this uh, in your lap, the last question kind of brought this to mind. I feel I, I, barn swallow habitat selection is a little confusing. They're, they nest singly and they also nest in groups. And it's sort of, I don't think anyone really knows why at certain places they do and why, you know, you could have two same size barns and one could have 20 pair and one could have eight pair. Um, and I think just a little humility with, um, you know, looking at sort of the long history of evolution and that there are a lot of complexities in natural systems and that, um, there's so, there was so much time for all those complexities to build up and subtleties and in, in evolution that it, I think we shouldn't have so much presumption in thinking that we can quickly understand what they're doing and that we should take the cues from them. If they're using something, that's a clue that it's working and maybe look at what's working a little more carefully before trying to mitigate. Um, so just, I'd say a little more humility would be my and, and, and a little more uh, looking at, at what's working rather than jumping to conclusions um, without much data. I think too, we need to look at species decline and, and the very complex reasons for those declines as um, and our long history with these species as, as clues to maybe how we might live in a better way um, you know, we might not know so much about why exactly 
um, these species are disappearing, but we know what major contributing factors are. We know it's habitat loss in, in a variety of you know, ways that habitat might be defined. We know it's human development and light pollution, for example, in urban centers that affect migratory birds. We know it's due to insect decline, due to pesticide use, and we know it's due to unpredictable weather attributed to climate change. And so these are the kinds of things that, that add up that we, we can consider and we can um, think critically about and, and try to mitigate those things even when we can't think like a bird. What really interests me, uh, I guess building a little bit off of what Mara was saying is as a parallel species, the barn swallow really makes visible how incredibly uh, entangled we are with non-human species. And the barn swallow is a very visible example of that, but you know, it kind of brings up the whole issue of our entanglement with those other species and our impact on them that uh, on uh, all kinds of species, of course, that are less visible than the barn swallow, but that also we, we impact um, on, a, on a daily basis and sometimes on a catastrophic basis without even realizing it. So the barn swallow, as Jen said earlier, a canary in the coal mine for um, interspecies kinds of entanglements that we need to be more aware of. Yes, and I'll also echo what Mara and Marcel said, that we have to be more mindful that everything that humans do has an impact on all wildlife species, not just the ones that are already endangered or threatened. And we shouldn't like wait so long for a common population to start becoming more threatened in order to take action and make sure that the technologies that we are developing are more wildlife friendly. And I think we can do better as well as um, educators in a nature sphere to, you know, really be celebrating everything people see. Um, I can be bad at it. Sometimes people are excited about seeing something that's maybe not that exciting to me because I see it all the time, but to meet people where they're at and really um, experience that excitement with them because everybody's in a different place and everybody's sort of navigating and experiencing things differently. And I think we should be, you know, not always just excited about the really rare sightings, but excited about everything. Because, um, you know, I hear from people all the time things like, oh, back in my day, I used to see hundreds of bobolink. Now, not so much. Now it's exciting when you see one, or you wouldn't believe the monarchs I used to see growing up when um, the migration would come through. So, you know, you just don't even understand what you've already lost because we're, you know, we're only here for such a glimpse of it. So I just want to end by thanking all of our amazing panelists here today, Mara, Jen, Marcel, and Marie. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Chris, as well, for engaging us in a great conversation tonight. And of course, thank you to all of you who tuned in. We will be posting this on our YouTube channel as well. So anybody that missed it tonight or wants to share it with others, please look out for that. I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening. And uh, if you want to see more events like this and you have topics that are of interest to you, please email me, research at rarecites.org. We want to hear from you. We want to keep bringing interesting people together to talk about interesting topics in nature. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jenna. Thanks,